Dear ladies and gentlemen, I know that uh, it's not uh, usual for Moscow to start on time because usually we have like half an hour delay or 50 minutes delay. But today we have a very special situation. We are having uh, Jerry Goraway. He's been uh, the assistant for Louis Bourgeois uh, more than 30 years. Uh, now he's the president of, of the Eastern Foundation. So I'm very happy to welcome here Kate Fowl and Jerry Gorovoy. Uh, Kate is the uh, chief curator of Garage Museum, and Jerry has been um, the assistant of Louis Bourgeois for 30 years, and uh, he has to leave tonight, actually, and uh, he actually fully immersed in uh, Moscow life, and he knows much more about us than uh, ourselves, so I'm sure that we'll find uh, a lot of interesting information about Louis Bourgeois works. I'm sorry um, that there's some noise here. I know that some more people are going to be late and join us uh, uh, after we start uh, and uh, uh, we are going to be uh, quite uh, um, uh, brief because um, Jerry has got only one hour before he goes and so I hope that you have a chance to ask your questions. So let's welcome our guests. Hello, it's great to see so many people here tonight. Thank you for coming because I know that this is possibly the busiest week in Moscow, the Moscow calendar of the year. So uh, thank you. And thank you, Jerry, for agreeing to do this. It's a real privilege to have the opportunity to have a conversation with you and to share your insight with the audiences here. Um, I have to say that Jerry has been here for 10 days and it's been an incredible experience walking around um, the show and literally kind of like learning how the works get put together and learning some of the background stories um, to the works as we're literally installing. And it's been, it's been fantastic that you could spend so much time here. I've had a great time too. <laughs> so um, what I thought I'd do is I, I have 10 questions. If the answers get quite long, then maybe I'll end up asking eight questions because I want to make sure that we have enough time at the end for you to be able to ask questions for yourself. So I'm going to leave 20 minutes for, for questions from the audience. But I'd like to start, Joey, by going back to the beginning um, and ask you how you met Louise Bourgeois in the first place. I was a young student in graduate school studying painting. And I was working part-time in a gallery to support myself while living in New York. And the gallery owner, um, decided to let me do a show. Um, and I organized a group show and I included a work of Louise, an early wood piece. And Louise came to that opening and I got to, it was my first really encounter with her. And we had a big fight over the installation. Then she calmed down and we became friends. She hadn't shown that much and she was nervous to show. and. It was a difficult beginning, but then the show was successful, and then she invited me to her house, and she showed me some more of her works, and then I organized a one-person show of her drawings. And from there, we started to spend more time together. We'd go to see shows and movies, and I started to try to make sense. She had an incredible body of work that was stored in the house that hadn't been seen, and I tried to make sense of what she had done, because when I met her, I, nobody could have known the body of work that she had stacked all over the house. It really was like a tomb, and the chronology wasn't totally clear to me. It wasn't, I didn't have a sense of it, I mean, it was much. Um, but I was fascinated and totally mesmerized by her as a person and what she had created. So it was all a mystery to me, and I was seduced. So then I started working an afternoon, then it led to a day, a week, then it led, you know, and then it was 30 years later, basically. So talking a little bit more about that, can you say, I mean, did, did she turn around to you and say, Jerry, I want you to be my assistant. You must, you must assist me. Was it, was it something that she formalized? And after that, can you say a little bit about how things changed? Mm -hmm. Because obviously when you met her, she wasn't anywhere near as well known as she was within a few years of you actually um, working together. So. Um, 
Things change pretty quickly. I mean, as we got to know each other and spend more time, she wanted me to spend more time with her. Um, as I said, she had sort of like an underground reputation. Wasn't, she wasn't totally unknown, but she... It, I came to, to understand that she didn't really like having exhibitions. It was too anxiety-producing, and she really, in a strange way, I think she wanted to show, but she had realized it was too difficult for her. So that was a pact we made. I said, you do the work, I'll help you realize what you want, and I'll do the shows, I'll do the installations, I'll work with the gallery. So we sort of divided into two sort of, we did different tasks, really, you know, complementing each other. And she began to trust me, basically. And then I kept organizing more shows, and then there were other people involved. There was Deborah Y from the Museum of Modern Art, who did an amazing show in 1982, the first retrospective, because the body of work was so diverse. She kept switching material scales and forms, figuration, abstraction, and so it's very hard for people to have a sense of what she's doing in a way. Now you have a lot of artists working in various forms and materials, and, but at the time most people had a sort of codified signature style and the Wies really didn't adhere to any one thing. The work was psychologically consistent and incredibly formally inventive, but given what, where the art world was and that sort of modernist post-Greenbergian thing, I think her work was sort of you know, sort of laid outside. I mean, Louise knew art history. She was married to an art historian, but she wasn't really interested in history. Um, so I think that what she, she had created and what I now, after, and I keep looking at the work, it's still complex to me. I still see new things in the work, but you know that she was very singular in a way, the way that she worked and the way that she sort of created her own world, her own vocabulary, this sort of symbolic, poetic world that was strictly hers. It's not to say she doesn't relate to art history and she doesn't fit in, but she sort of remained outside of it. Um, I was asked a number of times um, yesterday what the Eastern Foundation is. And um, I wonder if you can talk, because you are the president of the Eastern Foundation now, but and it's, um, can you talk a little bit about what the foundation is and what its purpose is? Well, the Easton Foundation is really Louise's foundation, but she didn't want it to have her name. Easton is a uh, city in Connecticut where she had a small house, um, which is still in the family. And essentially, uh, when Louise passed away, she left her house in Chelsea to the foundation. She had a studio in Brooklyn, which she had to abandon in 2006. It was a quite a large factory, very similar actually to the garage in some respects. Uh, we had to get out of there because they were building a big sort of stadium for concerts and all that. So we had no choice to give up. So a year before she passed away, her neighbor knocked on the door and said, I want to move. Do you want to buy the house? And I said, yes, instantly. And so the foundation now has sort of combining these two houses, which will be a, not so much an exhibition. Um, it's domestic, even though Louise did create there from the 1960s to the 80s, but it's not suited really for where the work went. So it's going to be mostly a residency program where people could stay at the house next door, have access to the archives, have access to, um, and it's a vast archive. I mean, Louise wrote their incredible diaries, loose sheets of writing. I mean, it's still a body of work that, in terms of the, the writing and the diaries and all that, there's still a lot of uh, things that could be learned from her. And she never threw anything out, so we have everything. And how, how does the foundation work with the actual artworks? Because, for example, when you go and see the exhibition, um, you'll see at the bottom, many of them are the collection of the foundation. So. Yeah, Louise, um, when she set up the foundation, I had decided a long time ago that when she did cast works and cast editions, we'd always keep the AP. So I never sold an AP of her work. So we have one cast of every piece she ever did, regardless of the material. Um, and we have, all the, we have all the archives. As I said, it's a vast archive. We have lots of photographs, books, loose sheets, diaries. You know, it's, we're still processing it now. And the house opens? The house, we're hoping to have it. We've had people stay there. Groups have got, had a preview, and we've had a few uh, museum people stay there already. But officially, it'll be open probably the end of October. So to tell
turn to the exhibition that is um, opened, well, opening tonight, opening last night. Um, can you, the, the cell st series was started in 1991 with a few works that are now seen as the precursors to these cells. Um, in 1991, Louise was 80 years old. So um, can you talk a little bit about how this series started and why um, at this age she starts to make basically a series that lasts for around 20 years and becomes one of the most significant kind of bodies of work that any artist of that age has ever made. Well, so when Louise was 80, she was really like a 50-year-old. I mean, she was quite a lot of energy. Um, but essentially, there were many reasons for the development of the cells. Um, the first thing is, as I said, Louise didn't show that much. She had vast gaps, you know, she, for example, from 1953 to 64, she, would, she didn't even have a one-man show. It's 11 years where she just sort of disappeared from the art scene. Um, but there was a change in her working method. At a certain point, she started to incorporate objects that she had held on to her that came from her life, that had meaning to her. Um, and she began to incorporate the, in her art. So she needed some sort of container for these objects. Sometimes it was furniture, sometimes it's just a sign from her father's gallery, or sometimes it's the clothing that belonged to her mother. I think that she had held on to a lot of things and they had a lot of memories for her. And in a, by incorporating them in a work of art, she knew that they would live long after um, she was gone. So it was her way of holding on to these things. So that was one aspect of it. But also as she started to show more and I was showing her images, as I said, at a certain point Louise wouldn't go to openings. She went to a few and then she basically did not even want to go to her own openings, even if they were in New York. Um, but when she saw some videos and all that, she realized that what she had been showing, the earlier stuff in the 80s, they were being shown in vastly different spaces that she had created and the scale had changed. So I think one thing, as she was showing more, she wanted to set the scale for her own works. And by enclosing them in the structures, they seem more like self-contained worlds and all the equivalents are pretty much established. It's not to say they look different in various spaces, but the interior is pretty much fixed and the scale is also fixed. So I think there's all that's reason. And then she had the factory, the studio had lots of remnants of furniture and shelving and all that. And Louise didn't throw anything out. So it was also a way of cannibalizing a lot of stuff that was in her studio that had been in storage from its former life as a sewing factory. Um, and she started to use that material as the raw material to build the cages to these ideas of enclosures. And can you say a little bit about um, how the word cells came to be the name of the series, or a word that she would use repeatedly around this body of work? Well, she talked about it basically like a prison cell or a monk cell. It's isolation. You're in this world, you're cut off, you're alone. It could be a form of punishment. It could have to do with tying to guilt or the biological cell. So it had both that thing. Because Louise was always interested in this idea of merging of the body and the architecture. And the word cell automatically you know, contains the idea of a body and a piece of architecture. It's interesting what you say in terms of um, the way that she wanted to create the scale for her work. Um, because you've seen the work in many, many different places. And um, one of the interesting things that I um, learned, if you like, from Jerry when he first came to do a site visit at Garage was that um, he was excited, or you were excited for the um, space because it's actually not the traditional white cube kind of museum space. And so you were saying that it's much closer to the studio in feel and just now. Um, so have, have you seen that, have, has, it, has the work often been shown in places that are outside these kind of white cube environments, was there a way in which Louise was trying to kind of get outside the museum structure in different ways? I mean, they've been shown in various architectures and various scale, but I think for her, it's more the interior and the containment in a way. I think the, the other thing is more an acceptance of the architecture that, that it's in and, and try to deal with that. But I think it's more the internal dynamics is really what's important to her, mm. or more than the exterior space. And did, did she consciously um, know that this was going to be an ongoing series? Because she makes the first six cells, 
and they're called cell 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 for the Carnegie International um, in 1991. And at that stage, was she talking with you or do you have any idea about whether she was thinking, oh, this is something I want to continue or was it like uh, more? Louise, nothing was that methodical or planned out. Louise was very intuitive. so. It did. However she felt that day would determine what she would work on that day. There was no, you know, she always said, and I always thought it was beautiful, she always said, you know, it's like a destination without any, you know, it's a journey without any destination. She had no idea where she was going with the piece, but she knew she was on the right track, you know, she, and so it, it would constantly change. I think the series, if you look at them from the early sales, which are much more sort of a decrepit splendor. The end cells are much more ethereal where she's actually making the cells rather than old doors and stuff like that. And yeah. so there's a trajectory in them. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what would, if she had continued what she had stopped it or she made more, I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, think, um, I think it had to do with the, the way that she was continuing trying to process. I mean, there was a conceptual thing that she was trying to process as much as the material that she had held on to uh, as quickly as possible. And so I think that was the overriding thing is that she had a number of things that she wanted to make works of art out so that they would survive. I mean, you know, Louise never talked about death. She never talked to this, but I think there was a sense that she had held on to these things and she didn't want them thrown out or discarded, that she, you know, that they meant too, you know, a lot to her and mm. she wanted them. And as she was making them, all this stuff, like working with clothes and all these things are forms of a diary. I mean, if you, anyone looks at, I was saying the other day, if you look at your clothes, you have a good sense of who you are, where you were, who you were with. It brings back all these memories. And for her to use these objects were all part of a larger project of dealing with memories and emotions and trying to understand the present. I mean, Louise was not nostalgic at all. But I think it was the idea to, to understand the present by going back like you would do in psychoanalysis or therapy. Mm. So perhaps to take that a little bit further, um, there is a sense of narrative. I think you can feel a sense of narrative when you look at these works. And um, she has talked, and you have, um, whilst you've been here, talked about the fact that there is a kind of biography in the works. Um, but at the same time, um, it seems that it's not necessarily important to know that story or that biography to actually um, get something or kind of feel something about the work. Um, and I wonder, I know Louise often said um, she was making work for herself first and foremost. She wasn't thinking about the audience. You know, she's not thinking about the kind of exhibition of art. Um, so can you talk a little bit about like how narrative or a bit further about how narrative and biography kind of what it, what it meant for Louise and what it means for her to be working with this kind of thing while also not necessarily wanting to be nostalgic or um, kind of tell her own life story. Well, I think one thing is the working process, which for her, you know, she's just, there are no words. She's not, you know, as I say, it's more, she lives in a visual world and she's manipulating materials and forms and all that. So there is, you know, she doesn't think a work of art needs any words. It needs no defense. She doesn't need it to be part of art history. So she never really, but she was very articulate about her own essential motivations for making art, what art meant to her. And she could talk specifically about a piece, but then she knew when the piece was out in the world, it would take on its own thing. But I mean, she always said that she talks about very basic emotions. Um, you know, the idea of being rejected, the idea of being abandoned or being made to feel inferior or rejected. I mean, so those are universal things, and I think those things are in the pieces, and no matter what culture you are or whatever, I think these kinds of things are very universal feelings in a strange way. And I think that Louise had that capacity and gift to translate these sort of emotions into material. And I think people perceive it. There's something else that's um, interesting about it insofar as there's a, almost a kind of opposition or oppositional factor to each of the pieces. And she talked about some of the cells um, attracting, some of them repulsing each other. She talked about the voyeurism in relation to the cells, and then other times she talks about immersion. So there's this kind of inside-outside, which is actually like one of the works is specifically about that. So um, is was she, was she interested in trying to kind of set up this oppositional or tension in some way, or was that? I don't think it was 
you know, as I said, is more intuitive. I don't think, I think when you're dealing with the realm of emotions, they're contradictory. And I think that that's really what, you know, she always has two contradictory states that are merged together. So you could really love someone, but you could also hate them. You know, you could be rejected by someone who could really hurt you, but you really want to please them. I mean, so I think a lot of emotions are automatically contradictory. You know, I think that in the realm that she was expressing, that's a given in a way. But I think that the cells, I mean, certain cells follow on the other. As you said, there is, a, she's developing one, she starts a second, and then she'll go back. And as she does a third, that might alter how she's thinking about the first. So she did orchestrate them in a way, going back and forth that way. And um, another question that I was asked um, a number of times yesterday was in relation to the studio. Because um, Louise, um, gets her first year before, as you said, she was working in uh, her, her Chelsea townhouse. And then um, it's 1980 that she gets the um, X factory in Brooklyn. And um, many people asked me yesterday, how, what was it actually like in the studio? You know, there's this woman who is working on a larger scale than she has um, worked traditionally. And um, she's dealing with much kind of larger found objects. So what, what was it like working with her? How did it kind of all work? Was she central to the whole, like? Oh, Louise was totally hands-on. I mean, at the beginning, it was just really her and me. There was nobody else. But if there would be a bunch of doors that came from the studio where someone else had doors in the building, she would sort of set them leaning against the wall, okay. Then she'd come up with a method to hinge them. Then I would bring a welder in who was you know, and say, can you just weld a piece of bar and let's hinge these up. Then we would make, stand up the architecture. And then she would be alone, just moving materials around and, and playing. And then we went to Italy and she made some marbles, which she, at one point, you know, had this idea that they would be incorporated in the cells. But, I mean, in the end, Louise never had myself and more than really two people. She did have a foundry doing the casting, but <laughs> Louise liked to be alone and work alone. I mean, she accepted my presence, but to be honest, anyone else there was sort of, sort of break the magic spell. She always said that she needed a certain silence and quiet. She didn't really like people yeah. around. It's interesting because you will be able to um, see more um, about the studio and about um, the way that Louise is making these works if you have the opportunity to go into the auditorium and watch the film that has been translated into with Russian subtitles. And Amai Wallach, um, who is uh, the producer of the film, is actually here tonight, she's talking in a couple of days' time about this film, and it's called The Spider, The Mistress, and The Tangerine. Um, but this, I think, is an incredible um, document, if you like, of what it was like in Louise's studio as she's putting many of these cells together. So, so um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to throw it open to the audience. There are, of course, a gazillion questions that you you will have, because we've only just touched the surface. But um, I, as I say, I want to make sure that you have the chance to ask what you need to ask. So um, the last question that I have is about Louise in Russia, because she comes to Russia in 1932 for the first time, and then in 1934. And I know that this is way before the time that you were working with her, but I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about what that was all about, and why she came to Russia, and what the story is behind that. Well. Well, Louise was studying really mathematics and philosophy at, at the Sorbonne. Then her mother died and it causes a shift in her. She got very depressed and she sort of left that kind of intellectual thing. She needed to sort of make sense of the chaos she was feeling in a way and she shifted and she sort of shifted into studying, moving into studying in art. Now her father wanted her to continue. Her father was in the tapestry restoration business and that was his goal, but she didn't really want to do that. And so she started pursuing art. And one of the teachers she had was a, sort of an illustrator called Paul Collin. Now they were talking in the, around 34. And he was a communist. And, um, but lots of intellectuals in France at that time were very interested in Russia, in communism. And Louise was going to write an article for the communist newspaper in Paris. Um, but she also said it was a way to get away from her father and sort of get back at her father because her father didn't really like Louise to get involved in politics or philosophy or, you know, I mean, he didn't, I think 
it was difficult because Louise was extremely, when her mother was alive, her mother wanted her to pursue more of an intellectual thing and the father thought that was really nonsense. He just wanted her to continue the business and get married. And, um, but I know that she, we have some documents, we have incredible photographs, um, but for her, I mean, it was just the beginning as she's moving into art. She came here to look at the theater uh, at that time, but I think it was just the beginning as she's shifting into art and just sort of, so I don't know, I can't say exactly how the th that particular experience, but I think it put her moving in a way to the world of, of creative kind of world and a, into the visual arts. And I think that that trip to Russia definitely had to be an early you know, moment of that transition and pivot. Why did she come twice? Do you know? I think she liked it. The first time she went to St. Petersburg and she was also going to Scandinavia. And then the second was just to Moscow mm. for the festival. Mm. Okay, so um, if you raise your hands, I'll try and see you in spite of the light. Um, and then if you could wait for the microphone to be passed to you so that it can be, um, your question can be translated, then Jerry can understand the questions. So, any questions? Get this one there and then one there. Thank you very much for the interesting insight information. And um, I'm interested, have ever Louis Bourgeois been trading on Sotheby's or Christie? Uh, works of hers have come up at auction, definitely, yes. So, uh, any Russian buyers? <laughs> there I mean, few, I mean there, I yes, there are a few, not a lot, there, but there many. are, yes. Uh, and uh, uh, how far the bid go? I'm sorry, what was the uh, question? Uh, what is the price? What was the highest price that was offered on the auction? I know they're all different kinds of work at, at various prices. I mean, it's just... Um... Okay, that, that's, that's three questions you've had so far, so maybe yeah, we should okay. go on to the next okay, one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you um, for the opportunity. Um, I guess my, um, my question is not about the artwork, but more about the personal life of uh, the artist of Louise and... Um, uh, my information um, is um, a little very certain um, way, um, certain art. I've heard that uh, she's now giving uh, some kind of vernissage. I guess it was in New York, and she's gathering um, a lot of um, artists together. And she's also known for giving advices for um, artists, um, which is also very... Mm, considered to be hard for her and I want to know first um, maybe maybe I'm just wrong and um, all this just never happened and m my question would be um, how how does it how can it be put together like for her as a person um, who enjoyed um, always have been enjoying silence and um, actually absence of people how is she how is she be um, how did she become a person like in the middle of the art life, so to say, this, um, this thing. First of all, when Louise worked, she liked privacy, but she wasn't like a hermit. I mean, Louise had friends, mostly young people. Louise always hung around with young people. She never hung around with older people, very few. But on Sunday was the one day that we didn't go to her studio in Brooklyn, and a way of occupying the day is she would invite, it started out more informally, she would invite a few people to the house, and they slowly evolved to more artists came and then she it became more like a salon like a sunday salon where the house was opened up to artists musicians writers poets and everyone was invited to come you know she would try to keep it to maybe 10 12 people the only condition was you had to bring something you had to bring something either play something record something or read something you couldn't just come as a voyeur and it was her way of really keeping in touch of what was going on. I mean, Louise did like to you know, know what was going on and she did, Louise taught, I mean, at, in school at a certain point after her husband died, it was actually very therapeutic for her, it got her out of the house. So, I mean, Louise liked hanging around with young people. We went out to openings, we went out to, you know, movies and theater. And so Louise liked, you know, I mean, I think Louise, to be honest, wanted to get outside of herself. She wanted to be sort of, hear other people's stories. 
It was sort of a, uh, a break, f f you know, from our own internalization. There's Thank a question you. over here. Yeah. The compositions in the cells themselves are quite beautiful, and the arrangements are very careful. And I know that Louise was a very great draftsman. So I wondered if she did pencil drawings in preparation for arranging the things, or were they just intuitively put together on site as three-dimensional arrangements and then like monkeyed with them that way? I, I wondered how much uh, drawing she did in preparation uh, for finalizing the cells. Um. Mostly is intuitive. They're very, I mean, Louise drew a lot, but usually there are very few drawings that are direct correlation to the, her sculptural output. It's a totally different kind of uh, creative outlet. So for the sales, it was much more intuitive. There is no, no drawing, really. I can't, yeah, there's a question there. Could you please talk a little bit about her last drawings, the drawings she made her last year? I saw them in mm. Munich exhibit, and they are amazing. Nothing <coughs> to compare with that, I think. Okay. Well, whatever the drawings you saw in Munich are actually here. Yeah, they they're they're in the show here. You haven't seen the show, but you'll see them here. It's because some people yeah. haven't got in yet. Uh, so. Louise, yeah, uh, Louise drew a lot towards the end of her life. I mean, Louise drew in blocks. She drew like a little bit in the 40s and 50s, and then. For about seven, eight years, she didn't make any drawings. Then she drew again in the 60s, and she'd be very few drawings in the 70s. And then she began drawing again in the mid 80s and continued uh, to the end of her life. I think the drawings that she was doing later are much, she actually wanted to up the scale in a way. So that if you see the show, you'll see some of the drawings have, have gotten much larger. Sometimes she's starting out with prints and working on a template and doing variations on them. and incorporating a lot of text in a way. Um, but I, and drawing was important to her because it's very quick. A drawing is very spontaneous and you could, the drawings are actually much looser as she's, she's painting more with the works on paper. They're much more fluid and liquid and much more about chance and drips. And so, I mean, the working, the drawings are very different at the end of her life, but the working method is also very different um, in a way. But the drawing meant a lot to her because of, I think it just, you know, with sculpture you need, it's a slight more resistance. It's not so easy. Sculpture is more of a compromise for what you want to do, and then you have to be able to do it. You have the resistance of the material, whereas with a piece of pencil and paper, there's really no resistance. And if Louise didn't like a drawing, she could just begin again, whereas a sculpture, if you're having difficulties, sometimes it's very hard to rectify. I may have another question, because those drawings are uh, I feel like I've, in some ways they are reckless and they denying uh, death. That's why I'm asking you, how did she encounter aging? That's very interesting for me. She never talked about death to me. I mean, she talked about more specific things. Louise had terrible insomnia. She talked about other things that were afflicting her. But um, I mean, she definitely knew that her body, you know, was definitely you know, at a certain point at the end of her life, she had to go in a wheelchair. I mean, and so, but her mind was active to the very end. I mean, she was so, um, maybe, I mean, maybe it was the denial of something, but I think she always needed to work to live. And I think it did reduce her anxiety by working. I mean, if she wasn't working, that's when, you know, things became difficult for her. The, the working definitely had a therapeutic aspect to it, for sure. Good evening. I'm sorry, I'm going to speak Russian. I would like to ask you about your opinion about social role of art and whether this opinion has changed over the lifetime. Thank you. Opinion about social uh, role of art. If I understand the question, I mean, I think Louise thought art was really about self-expression and if that had a, so that had meaning to her, if it had any meaning outside of what it did to her, that's almost the, un, the realm of the unknown. I mean, Louise wasn't trying to communicate anything. She had no overriding ideology. She had no idea of 
of the medium as any sort of honing in on anything. I think it was really this belief in self-expression and having really the access to the unconscious to express deeper things. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, the question is, um, I know that uh, connection to the mother with Louis, Louis Bourgeois to her mother is very obvious in her work. I, the question is, how is uh, the connection to her father after he died? She stopped for working for 10 to 15 years, and is it um, any reflection in her work about her father? No, I, I, well, you have a piece you'll see here called The Destruction of the Father, which, is an exp which really expresses how she felt about her father, really. Um, I think it was a difficult relationship. I think she, there's no question she really loved him, but he was also very controlling and had an idea of what her life should be. And she didn't want that life. So when she met an American in Paris, she's like, I'm a runaway, I'm getting out. She packed her bags and she got out as quick as she could. So, um, and I think the early work, you know, it, it talks a lot about this reaction to her father, but it's also the father in relationship to other men, the power structure. It's not just her father per se, you know, it's about mm -hmm. the whole um, patriarchy in a way. Um, Thank you. And there is, a, there is then this slippage towards the mother beginning in the 1990s. Good evening, and my question is, uh, if she was a disciplined person, like she woke up and she thought like, I have to work today, like and I have to work every day, I have to do something like something, or she could afford like not doing anything for days, for months. I think she had, as I said, she was very anxious, so I think she needed to work to sort of calm herself down. But I think depending on her moods would determine whether she would want to do something three-dimensional versus something two-dimensional or something. I mean, she believed in, you know, Louise was in psychoanalysis for many years, so she really did believe in sublimation. So if she needed to, she would like clean out a closet that was therapeutic for her and it gave her value, but she could also make a drawing. She talks about the quality of sublimation to make a work of art. It's a little higher than cleaning the dishes, but I think she believed that there were certain activities that she needed to do, and whether how physical it was or how mentally challenging it was, I think that varied depending on how. But she did have to work. First of all, she's obsessive and she's compulsive. And so I think that, you know, she was always wrestling with her own demons all the time. I know that she was not known until she turned 70. Or maybe she was known, but by very few people. So I wonder how was she perceived by the artist community and how did she feel after she became famous? Because I think she influenced many artists. But it was a such a long period of being unknown. Um, so to say, no narrow existence in the shadows um, when she was known only by very few people. For example, I saw uh, those pictures that she knew Andy Warhol, maybe they were friends. But anyway, how did uh, her life change after she became famous? Well, I mean, as I say, Louise's life, it's very hard to answer your question because it varies at different parts of her life. But she was more social in the 40s and 50s. She hung around with all the abstract expressionists who she was showing with. So she hung out with de Kooning. She hung out with Jackson Pollock at the same time she knew, you know, when Giacometti came to New York or Corbusier and all that. So she was in the thick of things. But I think she knew that, you know, that being a, a woman artist in the art world, that that was a handicap, that, this, that it was quite difficult for a woman to, ch to achieve the same recognition and that being offered the same opportunities. I think that she accepted in a way, and that may have been partial why she withdrew. But it didn't stop her from working in a way. As I said, the work was about what it brought to her and how it helped her. Um, but I mean, if you read the diary, she definitely wanted to show, um, but 
It didn't change, even as she became more famous, as I said, she didn't go to her shows. She wasn't that involved. I mean, she realized there were interviews and I was traveling more and there were more exhibitions, but I don't think it changed her at all, really, in that sense. It did not change her relationship. She said that actually not having any recognition and being anonymous was actually quite helpful because then you really work for yourself. You don't have to deal with exhibitions or markets and all that. And so that being an anonymous was actually a plus. She could work in the silence and be undisturbed in a way which she thinks is quite healthy. I mean, one of the things when she would meet a lot of young artists, you know, really is the idea of, you know, dealing with everyone's interest in the art world, dealing with getting a gallery, getting a market, getting a show, trying to get a sale. And she always thought that that was sort of unfortunate that artists, even if they became famous very young, she thought it was a problem. She always described herself as a, a long distance runner. Who were her favorite artists, like maybe the old masters to whom she returned continuously in the museums, or maybe her contemporaries with whom she were friends? Really, favorite artists uh, who influenced maybe her art? Well, I mean, she definitely, I mean, it's a range of artists. I mean, she liked Bonnard, she studied with Leger. Um, and moving more contemporary. I mean, she liked Kokoschka, more expressionist things at a certain point, and then it sort of switched. I mean, she loved Richard Serra's work, for example, which is very different, or Ellsworth Kelly is very different. I mean, it, as she, you know, let's say from the 80s and 90s, I think she was more interested in things that were very different than what she was pursuing, in a way. She liked Robert Ryman, let's say. Or she did like, I don't know if I meant Lucy and Freud. She liked Francis Bacon. I mean, there is a range of work. Question next one. And then we've got, we've got time for one more question after that. So there you go. There's one more question back there. After, after yours. Okay. Um, uh, in terms of uh, his, the history of art, do you think that uh, Luis Bourgeois is uh, one of the last uh, modern artists, if not contemporary, modern? Uh, in terms of, for, of formal, uh, you know, um, modern, modern art. Well, I, it wasn't me who said it, but I think people saw her as a bridge to go from yeah. modern to contemporary. And she was probably that figure who sort of bridged the two in a way. So I would say she's a little bit of both. So just to push that a little bit further, um, in the conversation that we have in the catalogue, you were saying that um, you can see how contemporary her work is in relation to, like, even in the same period, in relation to some of the, what are now known as modern artists. So, There was an incredible exhibition of Louise at the Beiler Foundation, which is in Basel, Switzerland. And they decided to do an exhibition where Louise's work was put in dialogue. So she was next to Leger, next to Cezanne, next to Bacon, next to uh, various, you know, Giacometti. And, and it was interesting for me, it was a revelation because you see these artists have been sort of codified and almost ossified in history, like a period piece. Her work looked young. It looked, to me, she looked stronger than a lot. I mean in a way, because you couldn't, it didn't look like history had sort of made them, it reduced them. I mean, they almost seem timeless. They seem outside of history in a way. I mean, she belongs to history, as I said, and these works are being more and more, you know, becoming important to art history, but there's a timeless quality to her work. I think the way that she switched, and she wasn't trying to hone anything down, so she had, as I said, there was no major philosophy, no sort of overriding, kind of um, reducing anything or any theoretical. So I think in a strange way that her work um, forms its own sort of bubble. So the question at the back. Yeah, um, can you tell us a little bit um, the relationship of Louise with, uh, with photography, with the medium of photography? And, and of also if she was relying on somebody else close to her in documenting the work through photography? Or she was actually thinking of photography as, as a tool to make work. 
I don't think photography served as a tool for her. I mean, her works were documented, and I made sure they were documented in a way. But um, in the actual creative process, uh, once in a while, she, when she was working on a large marble, she would take a photograph so she could look at it in the night and think about what she wanted to do the next day. But it wasn't really a crucial medium. I mean, she liked photography. Um, she, but I don't think, as, as far as her creative output, I would say that it's not such a strong factor. So, unless there's like something burning out there, no, I'm going to say um, thank you, Joey, for sharing your, your knowledge and experience. I know it's not always easy to kind of make live things that you, know, you're, you have to recall from, from the past. Um, and I want to say to everybody that if you want to know more, there are um, a number of um, screenings and events. There's the resource room in um, Garage Museum. There's also a timeline and biography. Um, so there's many ways that you can kind of access more of um, the history of Louise as a person as well as the artwork. So I would um, encourage you to go and check out the resource room. And then there's also um, the catalogue um, that was produced by Haus de Kunst, who is the museum that we have collaborated with in Germany to um, produce this um, exhibition and bring it here, but we um, translated the catalogue into Russian. So please join me in uh, thanking Jerry for the conversation. Okay.